Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome along to the RTN TV online Bible study. It's Wednesday. It's the 3rd of February already. The year is flying by wherever you are. Everyone is still in lockdown. Everyone's still suffering the consequences of COVID to a larger or a lesser degree, depending on your, your government stance. But we're all with the Lord and we praise him for the safety that he's provided for us wherever we are today. We've been looking at Elijah and the Olivet Discourse, Jacob part one last week. And for those of you who were with us last week, you realize that we had a bit of an interruption, a few people trying their best to subvert what we were doing. Uh, but we got past that and we're here again tonight. But unfortunately, we've had to implement a few security issues to try and prevent the same thing from happening again. However, that has caused a few problems in itself because it's asking for codes of people to get them on board. Um, so there's some people got it, some people didn't. Um, unfortunately, because we've had to put these things into practice so, so quickly, it hasn't actually been as effective or as smooth as we'd like. But that's the way it goes. People are joining as we speak, and hopefully they will get the second email with the code as we go through the evening. So I'm just going to go to prayer as we speak. Uh, let Jacob start, and anyone who does come on board, we will just admit them as the programme develops this evening. As normal, we'll mute all your microphones, and then after the message, if you wish to ask Jacob a question, simply unmute your microphone, and I'll facilitate who's going to speak first, etc. But thank you all for joining us. Uh, wherever you are, we just thank you for passing on the message that it really has been a real success. And of course, to those of you who have joined us on the Facebook group, the RTN TV online Facebook group, thank you very much. It really is becoming a real blessing to those who are taking part in that because we're able to exchange and discuss things in relation to teaching. So if you're watching us on live stream tonight on RTN TV or via Morial TV on YouTube, welcome along. Jacob and part two of Elijah after we have this short prayer. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity again to come into your word. We always rely on you, Lord, for our protection, for our guidance, and for our strength at times, Lord, when we have feelings and we're unable to find that motivation, to find that certain something, Lord, to keep us going. So we thank you, Lord, that you always guide us and prompt us and tug us along sometimes by your Holy Spirit. Tonight, Lord, we just ask you to open this word, that we just don't hear it, but we actually understand it, we can digest it, and we can discuss it amongst ourselves on the Facebook group and our friends and our family, and be blessed and nourished by your word brought to us tonight by Jacob. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. If you were with us last week, we extend our apologetic regrets over the interruption. We had three crazy people, of sort hackers, and they took advantage of our open forum, and they came on and disrupted the Bible study. We got rid of them, but it was definitely... Uh, uh, well, it was not pleasant, but that's the reason we have these complications tonight, as Amos and Charles explained. Be that as it may, we're continuing to look at Elijah, and we will be building on what we looked at in part one. We're looking at Elijah, the element discourse. At least that's better. But with him talking. Please mm -hmm. like to the goal now. Please mute the microphones. Okay, we have to remember as always, and I've said it till I'm blue in the face, but we have some people with us for the first time. All of Israel's prophets, all of them, prophesied for at least three, sometimes four time frames. They all prophesied for their own time. They prophesied for the first coming of, of Jesus, of Christ. They prophesied for the second coming of Christ. And sometimes, as we'll see tonight, they prophesied panoramically, even for our time. I will be looking at that tonight, but just think of the four time frames. We'll be highlighting aspects of each of them tonight as we look at the Book of Kings. Something else we've pointed out a number of times, but I just mentioned it briefly for our first-time visitors, is this. All of Israel's prophets, all of them, free figure foreshadow Christ in some way. They're typological portrayals in the Old Testament of what Jesus would be and do. They're types, they're shadows of Christ, all of them, and Elijah, of course, is no exception. 
So look with me, please, first of all, to the last thing it says in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Malachi Hanavi, Paddock Arba, verse 5, or verses 4 and 5. We'll look at 4 and 5. Remember the law of Moses, the Torah, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers and their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Last thing it says in the Old Testament, Elijah was to come, but it's not primarily talking about the first coming. It's talking about Elijah has to come at the second coming in verse 5. More about that in a moment. Let's look to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 17. Verse 11, this is following the transfiguration. Jesus says, he answered, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the son of man is going to suffer at their hands. Now that tells us more than one thing. It tells us that the experiences of Elijah are replayed by the Messiah. John the Baptist was executed by a Her Herodian king. Jesus was executed by the Roman authorities at the behest of a Herodian king, and so forth. He's a type of Christ. This, of course, speaks of John the Baptist. He came, but he's going to come. So the Old Testament closes by telling us Elijah in some manner returns in the last days before Christ returns. And Jesus states, Elijah is coming and he will restore all things. We touched on this last week. Now let's go back again to Malachi In verse 4 of chapter 4, remember the Torah of Moses, my servant. Notice it puts Moses just before Elijah. This is one of the reasons some people, one of the reasons only that some people believe the two witnesses in Revelation will be Moses and Elijah. There are arguments for being Enoch and so forth. I'm not saying who they are tonight. I'm just saying that there are those who believe one is Moses, and this is one of the reasons they believe so. There are other reasons they believe so or speculate so, but this being one of them. It puts Moses and Elijah together. Now, let's understand this. John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah as we looked at last week. In Matthew's Gospel, we have a verse that has been wildly distorted for centuries, for centuries. Even one of my Christian, favorite Christian authors, William Gurnall, who wrote the book Christians in the Christian in Complete Armor, a brilliant, brilliant book by a very insightful believer, but his exegesis of this passage was wrong, where he quotes men taking the kingdom by force, men taking the kingdom by force. Uh, of course, the Dominion theology people, the kingdom now people, the Dominionists, <clears throat> the Restorationists from England, the NAR people very often, they take the same thing. We're going to take the army by, we're with the army is going to take the kingdom by force. And they tie this to the latter rain movement and manifest sons and all these other doctrinal errors that come about through distorting the book of Joel out of exegetical context. What does it mean 
that the law and prophets were preached until John. But now the kingdom which, which Jesus comes, violent men take it by force. It does not mean dominion theology. What it means is this. The word taking it by force or forcefully taking it is the word biazomai, in Greek biazomai. And that is, it's, it's almost the same as the Greek word for forcible rape. You force your way into something violently. What it means is this. The law condemns. The law is our tutor. The law shows we are fallen. The law, sh law shows we are indicted. The law shows we cannot keep God's standard. As a nice Jewish boy named Ray Comfort rightly teaches in Hell's Best Kept Secret, don't preach grace unless you preach law. <laughs> don't tell unsaved people that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life until you tell them that they're, that they're eternally lost and in need of salvation. Once people understand the Torah, now for non-Jews, this would simply be the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? You know, um, you steal a paperclip, you're a thief. Uh, so it goes. Unless people understand law, they can't understand grace. John the Baptist, the one in Hebrew called Yochanan Hamadibil, he was the epitome of righteousness under the law. None born among women were greater than John. As we looked at last week, he recognized Jesus embryonically because he was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb. Okay, so we have him. John represents the highest righteousness under the law. But John says he was least in the kingdom. Um, Jesus said he was least in the kingdom is greater than John. Whoever has the righteousness of Christ imputed, of course, has a higher righteousness than is possible with any religious observance, even the Torah. So, the ministry of Elijah shows people they're condemned. It shows people they are in trouble. It shows people they are heading for the judgment and wrath of God. But if you tell people on a ship that it's sinking, on the Titanic, and then you point out, but there's a lifeboat, they'll be frantically forcing their way into the lifeboat to save their neck. If people understand the message of the Torah of Moses, in the proclaimed in the character of Elijah, if they understand that, they will, and then they're told there's a way out of this. You're doomed, but there's one way out. They'll be forcing their way into the kingdom. It is not talking about us conquering the world for Christ before he comes. That is not the meaning exegetically. It is inconsistent with the meaning of the Greek terminology. That's not what it means. It means the law is preached until John. The Torah. Now, unless we understand the ministry of John, who came in the spirit of Elijah, we cannot possibly understand the ministry of Elijah in the future. Somehow, what John did, pointing people to Christ by showing them they're condemned, that they're in trouble, and coming against the religious establishment when he told the Pharisees, that God could raise up Abraham's children out of the stones, and so forth. Somehow, Elijah to come will replay that. Just as Elijah, in the, or John in the character of Elijah, proclaimed that to set the stage for the first coming of Christ, the same kind of message is reiterated to set the stage for the return of Christ. The coming Elijah is going to do that. Again, I've warned people not to pay attention to the silly <clears throat> song. I wouldn't even call it a hymn. These are the days of Elijah. They don't know what they're even singing about. These are not the days of Elijah, except in the very negative sense, not in a positive sense to celebrate or to sing about in a celebratory manner. We talked about this last week. So, we see that Elijah has a future meaning. He had a meaning for his own time with Ahab and Jezebel and the Phoenician control 
religiously of the backslidden people of the ten northern kingdoms. He had that meaning for his own time. That's the first thing we have to recognize as we looked at last week. But the second is that he has a meaning for the future. Third, he has a meaning for the first coming of Christ that teaches about the future. And then there is a fourth. Look with me, please, to the epistle of James. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three and a half years or three years and six months. Then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. It has a contemporary meaning for us, a current meaning. Meaning for his own days, okay, in the days of Ahab and Jezebel. A meaning for the first coming of Jesus in John the Baptist, okay. A meaning for us now, he's a man like us. John was unique, Elijah was not. And then a meaning for the last days. Before we can properly establish or even begin to address the issue, how will the ministry of Elijah return in the last days? Or how will Elijah come back before we can even go near that? We have to understand properly the first three. His own time, which we looked at last week. The first coming of Jesus which we looked at a bit last week with John the Baptist, and then what it means for us now, today, in 2021. Unless we understand those three, there is no point even approaching the question of what it means for the future. If we don't know what did happen, and we don't know what is happening, we are never going to understand what is going to happen. Everybody got that? Okay, let us continue then. We see that James emphasizes that he stopped the rain for three and a half years, three years and six months. Whenever you see that, you know it relates to the book of Revelation and to the book of Daniel, particularly Revelation. Two times, time and a half time, 42 months. Three and a half years, 1,260 days, slash 1,290 days in Daniel. Okay. What Elijah did happens again. That three and a half year period that James mentions that is in Kings, but is predicted to happen again in some way in Daniel and in Revelation, okay, has to be understood. What does it mean for his own time when he stopped the rain? What does it mean for the first coming of Christ? And what does it mean for the second coming of Christ? And also, obviously, what does it mean for us? He stopped the rain. As always, my never-ending Apologies to those who know it, but turn with me to Isaiah 44, please, verse 3. Let's begin with the rain. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. In other words, after a drought, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. The outpouring of rain is a figure, 
in biblical imagery of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of rain in biblical imagery is a picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When there's no rain, there's a drought. Where there's a drought, there is a food shortage. The water in Israel goes into the water table and in the aquifers, it forms something called Maim Hayim, living water. Hence, Jesus tells the woman at the well in John 4, and against the background of the Feast of Tabernacles, known as Simcha Bet Shoiva in John chapter 7, I will give you living water. I will give you the Holy Spirit. It's poured down, goes into the earth. But if there's no rain, there is no grain. Where there is drought, there is a food shortage. Now, to understand this further, look with me, please, if you don't already know, to the book of Amos, chapter 4. Amos chapter 4, Amos Hanavi, Amos chapter 4. Verse 7. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you. While there was still three months until harvest, I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. On one place would be rained on, but the place not rained on would dry up. The rain, the moist earth, and the drought happens in geographical patches. One place the Holy Spirit is being outpoured, another place it is not. Let us consider Britain and Europe at the present time. Great Britain is post Christian neo pagan as is most of the Protestant democracies. The Bible belts of Britain, which are the Hebrides in Scotland and Northern Ireland, they are running on the inertia of their Christian past. There is a drought in England, Scotland, and Wales. The churches are dead. In fact, their churches have committed spiritual, theological, and moral suicide. There's a drought. But there is one place God is indeed working in Britain. They've got their problems. Growth always brings problems. They're not perfect, and they had some crisis, some serious crisis. But it is raining in the gypsy caravan camps. There is not a gypsy family in Britain that does not have believers in it. In Spain and in Portugal, in Iberia, it is not an embellishment to say that something like 80% of the gypsies on some of these caravan sites have become born again. This is happening in Romania. It is happening in Bulgaria. I believe we have a Bulgarian brother with us sometimes. Is he here tonight? Wave if he is. There he is. Right there, Maya de Chiva. People are getting saved among the gypsies. They're not having a drought. They had droughts for generations, for centuries. There was a very anointed gypsy evangelist in Great Britain about 100 years ago called Gypsy Smith. But all the people who got saved through Gypsy Smith were non-gypsies. <laughs> Now, the gypsies are having rain. The gorges, the non-gypsies, as they call people who are not gypsies, it's, it's crazy. Like, you have Jews and Goys where you have travelers and, and gorges with the gypsies. They're having their rain. A lot of people do get saved among the gypsies. It's raining. Do they have problems? Oh, yeah, they got problems. Don't worry. They have some terrible things happen. But Growth is not one of them. Evangelism is not one of them. 
They've got these conferences where they come with the caravans in, in France and there's 10,000, 20, I don't know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they're growing. They haven't rained. Rain. We have a ministry in the Philippines, mainly with children. And I know of a case, and it's not a unique case at all, where there was a church planted. These are poor people. And in 18 months, within its first 18 months, that church planted five other churches, none of them with fewer than 200 people, save that of Roman Catholicism mainly. That's rain. No one who has seen a true revival. I got saved in a revival among the hippies, the Jesus movement. Nobody, nobody who's seen a revival will believe in Pensacola or Lakeland or Toronto or any of that stupid garbage. You'd know instantly those things are counterfeit. You'd know that they're just rubbish and, and, and frankly, lies. Um, just manipulated nonsense. If you've seen a real revival, you, you, know, you know what it is. And it's not the nonsense people call revival now. I've seen real revivals. I saw guys coming back to Vietnam strung out on heroin. They needed 120 milligrams of methadone a day not to lose their mind. And they were getting saved. Not one here, one there, but left and right. No cold turkey. No withdrawal. Just getting saved. I've seen it. Well, the hippies, the Calvary Chapel movement came from it. Jews for Jesus came from it. A lot of things came from it. When you see a real thing, people strung out on drugs and into acid and the occult and the hippie culture and the free love turning to Christ and launch. When you've seen the real thing, you will not believe the garbage people try to pass off as a revival. Now, it rains. The place rained on, going to have one situation. The place not rained on is going to dry up. But the rain is withheld in judgment. Now, it's not our subject tonight. I only mentioned it in passing. But we've all heard of the former and latter rain in the Hebrew calendar. There was an outpouring of God's spirit on Israel and the Jews in the beginning of the church, which was the day of Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. And it happens again, according to Joel, in the last days. As we always say, the first Christians were Jews, the last Christians were Jews. That is a related but separate subject to what we're looking at tonight. I only mention it in passing in so far as it relates to the issue of the rain being a figure of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does this fit with Elijah? Look with me, please, again to the Hebrew prophet Amos. The closing chapter of Amos, which is chapter 9. Okay. He gives all these prophetic promises. And he says things like in verse 9, I will shake the house of Israel as grain is shaken in a seed. And he keeps talking about all this stuff with grain. He also says in chapter 8, days are coming in verse 11, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. Meteorologically, where there's no rain, there's no grain. Spiritually, it's the same. Where there's no rain, there's no grain. There's a doth of spiritual food. Why are people coming on to Zoom to listen to somebody in England when they live in some other country, different time zone? <laughs> there's a famine. 
Well, there was a famine for the hearing of the word of God when John the Baptist came. There had not been a prophet for over 400 years since Malachi. The closest thing they had were the Maccabees fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel, but there were no prophets. Although the book of first and second Maccabees are biblically important history and literature, they are not canon and they're not prophetic, even though they teach things about prophecy. There's no prophet for over 400 years. There was a famine. In the Hasmonean period, Israel backslid. God withheld the grain after the Maccabees. And in fact, the whole epic of the Maccabees only happened because so many Jews cooperated with the Seleucid Greeks. There was a famine. No prophet. The word of God was rare. Just like, you know, we see in the book of Judges, the word of God was rare in those days. Well, the word of God was rare before Jesus came. John comes in the spirit of Elijah and feeds the people during the famine, okay? Just like Elijah did. Fed the people during the famine. The last days will be the same. Whatever the ministry of Elijah is going to entail before Christ comes, it is going to entail feeding people who are hungry. Now, we have a teaching we did that's available on the internet, I believe, called Kashrut and Famine, Kashrut and Famine, the typology of the Hebrew dietary laws. And we talk about how when people are hungry enough, they'll eat anything. I don't want to go into this in any depth, but you look at what people are eating today. I will never forget the time. One of the, I, I, Moria has a, a, a branch, a small branch in Japan, and I have to go to Japan from time to time. And the only thing I can understand in Japan is baseball, which they call Yaku because it's the same game. It's rounders in England, baseball in the States. And that's the only thing I can understand. I speak very little Japanese. And <clears throat> I watch it, you know. And I watched the news come on. And the news was for the American forces had their own news, news broadcast for the American military in Japan and in Okinawa. And it came on and I was watching it. And the people in Japan and the American military are very concerned about North Korea all the time. And it showed miracle food in North Korea, miracle food. <laughs> There's a food shortage. You know? It's unbelievable in North Korea, the food shortage. You've got young women conscripted into the military, and nearly all of them, nearly 100% of them, due to dietary inefficiency, are non-menstrual. They are non-menstrual simply due to malnutrition. It's unbelievable. But they had this miracle food, and they had this, these machines with these guys with these lab coats, and they were taking things like pumpkin leaves, Cellulose. Now, cellulose has no nutritional value to human beings. We do not have the digestive enzyme to, to catabolize it. Squirrels can eat it and rabbits can eat it, but pe people, you can eat it, but it, you, you can't digest it. They were stuffing these leaves into this one end of the machine, and on the opposite end of the machine, these strips or ribbons of pasta were coming out that were green, it looked like green fettuccine or something. And they called it miracle food. And by chemically treating it, they were able to give the miracle food to people that would artificially raise the monosodium glucose levels in their blood to trick their brain into thinking that they had eaten something. But they were still on the verge of starvation. It was all a con, but people will eat it. It's the same in the church. All you have to do is listen to the word faith money preachers or to the new apostolic reformation or to the proponents of ecumenism. They're eating make-believe 
food. So much of what we hear, as we know, is simply motivational speaking using Christian jargon. It's <clears throat> hype artistry. It's just religious hype artistry trying to mimic the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They're eating any. When there's no food, what do people do? I would again refer you to the teaching, Kashrut and Famine. Well, there was a famine for the hearing of the word of God. John comes in the spirit of Elijah. He's out in the wilderness. He's out there. And he goes against the entire school of religious presupposition of the day. As we said last week, his father was a high priest. He could have been a member of the religious establishment, which were a theocratic aristocracy. He declined to do so. And he went out into the wilderness dressed like Elijah with the, with, with the rough furry frock and whatever he had on in, in the belt and, and eating the locusts and things like this. Okay, so he's out there. And all Jerusalem was going out, it says, <clears throat> to hear John preach. Why? Because the Levites were not teaching the word of God to the people anymore. And the presupposition was, because we are part of the national covenant, covenant, because we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we are in a covenantal relationship with God, and we're all right because of our birth. Well, the same thing will happen at the return of Christ. People will begin saying that because of their second birth but they're not being faithful. John told these people, the religious leaders, God could raise up <clears throat> Abraham's children out of the stones. Remember what Jesus said, again, most of you know this from our other teaching. If you don't proclaim me, the stones will cry out. If the Jews don't proclaim him, the Christians will. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, we are the living stones. Christians are the stones of the temple. God could raise up <clears throat> children of Abraham out of the stones. Uh, believers are, even non-Jewish believers are co-equally descendants of Abraham by faith in the seed of Abraham. Remember, Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. He was both a non-Jew and a Jew. That's how he, ha he had to qualify to be the father of all who believed. So we have this. They thought just because of their background, their religious background and their national identity and so forth, that it was right. I'm telling you, there, there are people in the United States who think that. They believe in this myth of Christian America that, that's no longer a fraction of the truth it once was. It may have been partially true at one time, partially true, but it's not true now. And I can say the same about a lot of other countries, including in the Anglosphere. Nonetheless, you've got this. When Elijah comes, he will come against this. And the ministry of Elijah will take place outside of the religious mainstream. It'll take place outside of the religious mainstream. Again, I point back to the Jesus movement, the revival among the hippies. Most of the established churches wanted nothing to do with these kids. They said, go get a haircut. I remember looking at a catalog of Moody Bible Institute where I was considering going at one time. And it had a picture of D.L. Moody and R.A. Torrey, the founders on the cover. And they had long hair and beards in the 19th century. And on the first page of the book, it says, you can't have long hair, hair or a beard to go to Moody Bible Institute. So I said, well, if D.L. Moody couldn't go to Moody, I'm not going to Moody. <laughs> this open stuff, people like Morse Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, and Chuck Smith, founder of Calvary Chapel, they were ridiculed. They were ostracized by their denominations and mission boards and things like this because they accepted the hippies. The Jesus movement was something that largely happened outside of the mainstream of denominational evangelicism. That's only a hint of what it's going to be like in the end. Denominationalism is dying. Now pay attention. It's dead. Now pay attention. What you see happening now 
God has allowed it. I said this right from the beginning. COVID is a boost to Christian homeschooling, isn't it? It's a cloud with a silver lining. You can't send your kids to these state schools with their teaching kids. You can't do that. It's crazy. Last week, Biden, he signed an executive order that people who are transgender or just claim a different gender can enlist in the military as, 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 as a female. Or as, and so now you have to have women in the military share shower facilities with men who claim to be women. When I was 14, if you let me take a shower with the cheerleaders, I had no problem saying that I was a woman in a man's body. I would have been a kangaroo if you wanted me to. But this is not a policy of the American government. This is how sick and perverted it has become, and they're teaching it in schools as normative. That's how sick it is. These mega churches that have compromised, these churches that have gone ecumenical, these churches that have gone into the NAR, this is God's judgment on Laodicea. You understand? What is happening now is God's judgment on Laodicea. I am certainly not the only one, and probably, I'm certainly not the only one or the first one, and probably there are many people who knew it. But since the 1970s, since I was a young Christian, I was not saved all that long. I remember when churches began canceling their midweek Bible studies, which were normally held on a Wednesday in the States, and we're going to home groups instead. We're going to have home groups and people are going to meet in homes midweek instead of the Wednesday Bible study. We'll only come to church on Sunday and things like that. And this gained popularity in many countries. I knew at that time, and again, I'm not saying I was the first or the only one, I wasn't. But I knew at that time, this was the Holy Spirit preparing the church for future persecution. That a time would come when that's the only church we would have. That the body of Christ would end the way it began. Believers meeting in homes in small groups. Uh, who knows how much longer before social media cracks down on what we're doing at this moment. That's why we have RTN. We're making our own platforms because we just can't trust social media. We can't trust these things anymore. They're very anti-Christian, very anti-God. Nonetheless, that's the way it is. The Lord is allowing these things. There is a famine. And in this famine-infested environment, God always has a way to feed his people. With this in view, turn with me, if you'd be so kind, to 1 Kings chapter 17. I'll be reading from the New International Version, though I may make references to the original Hebrew text on certain points. 1 Kings 17 tonight. Elijah predicts this drought. Again, a figure of the Holy Spirit being withheld in judgment. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, Gilead's like the Golan Heights, the lower Golan Heights, said to Ahab, as the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now, notice he stood before the Lord. We have references in Zechariah of people in heaven standing before the Lord. Remember the prophecy of Zerubbabel and Yeshua, not Jesus, the other Yeshua, and Zechariah and so forth, they were before the Lord. Okay, you don't have to be translated to heaven to stand before the Lord. We can stand before the Lord right now. We can stand before the Lord right now by the Holy Spirit. 
not in the same sense, but we can stand before the Lord. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the book, book of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook. I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook of Kerit, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain on the land. Let's begin with east of the Jordan. Bethany, Bethany, beyond the Jordan. John the Baptist ministered on the other side of the Jordan, didn't he? Where Elijah crossed, near, very near to where Elijah crossed. Okay. Uh, east of the Jordan. Okay. Jesus is baptized by John there. In John 10, when they reject Jesus and try to kill him at Hanukkah, where does he go? Where John was. <laughs> Outside of the land. Close to it, but outside. God is going to meet the needs of his people in the famine. The way he always has. But we have to be willing to go outside the conventional norms of where we've always dwelt. Again, if you have a good church, thank God, you're very fortunate. But I can't tell you how many people contact us in desperation looking for one. I can't tell you how many good people I know have had to leave their churches and meet in small groups and homes or are coming onto forums like this simply because they can't find the church. Thank God for the ones that remain, but they're becoming fewer and further between, aren't they? God, however, will feed you. If you are hungry for the Lord and for his word, he will feed you. However, it will be in places nobody expected. If two years ago you said to people, you're going to get most of your teaching on the internet by Zoom and you'll have no church to go to, that wouldn't have seemed realistic two years ago. It wouldn't have seemed realistic 18 months ago. But it's happened. Now again, none of this has surprised me. I've known it was gonna go this way since the 1970s, as have other people. But what has surprised me? The pace at which it happened? The way at which it happened? That surprised me. Not that it happened, that doesn't surprise me. It shouldn't have surprised any of us. I think by the Holy Spirit and from the scriptures, we all knew it was coming. But the pace at which it arrived? Again, the virus and politically manipulated China virus and, and reactions to it. Things may have an interim recovery period, ecclesiologically, but the church will never be the same as it was. It'll never be the same as it was. This is God's judgment on Laodicea. It's God's judgment on Laodicea. He got fed up with the false prophets tickling people's ears. He got fed up with the people being a market for their product and wanting to hear it, accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. It is obvious that the false, proven false prophets like Pat Robertson and Beth Moore and these people was showing Christians Trump was going to win and God's hands on. God had enough of these false prophets. He's taking their ministry away in one. Well, where do we go now? To the brook of Kerit. <laughs> Across the Jordan. Well, what are they going to do for food? 
The Ravens bought him bread and meat. That's a pretty good diet in a famine, isn't it? That's a pretty good diet in a famine. As long as you're going to the right place to get it. Now the ravens, for Elijah, the ravens were not a kosher bird. They were not a kosher bird. They were unclean. Ravens were an art. It's, even today in Jewish dietary law, kashrut, ravens are an unclean aviary creature. They're unclean. Well, they fed Elijah. You go on the internet, my friend David Lister, who was a memorial administrator in America, he sent me something one time. I couldn't believe it. The single biggest category of website subscriptions in most of the world are online pornography. <laughs> I mean, you think sports or, or something like that. You think something else, you know, with the, the thing that people have subscribed to the most, it's, it's an unclean medium, isn't it? <laughs> Not inherently wrong in itself, but it's an unclean medium. The stuff I've seen, and the dishonest advertising and the manipulation, and then the lies of the media and the social media, the endless lying and the misrepresentation of truth, revisionism, everything. No, it's a raven. It's a raven. You're not sitting in front of a computer screen. We're sitting in front of a raven. But the Lord is feeding us. He's giving us bread and he's giving us meat. Not the normal way you get it. But we're getting it. For now, notice the brook dries up. It is obvious to anyone, particularly Christians who I've spoken to, and I've spoken to many who are in the computer industry. A few of them are with us tonight. It is only a matter of time before the brook of Kedit dries up, before they begin cracking down on Christian websites and restricting what you can Zoom and Skype. It's only a matter of time. We're in the right place now. The ravens are bringing us the food now. But this brook is going to dry up, friends. Again, that's one of the reasons we've become RTN with other like-minded ministries, John Haller and so forth, GCR, and Radio Watch the Mood and so forth. We, we need to make our alternatives. The brook is going to dry up. This is not always going to be possible. It's an unclean bird. But right now, we're where we're meant to be. Not a place we would have expected 18 months ago or 24 months ago. Here we are. No more conferences for the time being, at least. Just talking to Beryl today. No, no, no day seminars, no, no, no church meeting. No, no. This is it. This is it. For now. But what's going to happen to us? When this ends, and we can rest assured it's only a matter of time before it does. Let's see what's going to happen to us next. What's going to happen to us next is what happened to Elijah next. It's no secret. It's right there. God told us what it is. Continue reading with me, please, in chapter 17 of 1 Kings. Resuming in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. 
So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And she was going to get it. And he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, notice your God, not our God, not my God, your God. As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the dish and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and for my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go do as you've said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterwards, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the dish of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. She went and did according to the words of Elijah. And she said, and he said to her, to household, and ate for many days. The dish of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of the oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, when he spoke to Elijah. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was severe. There was no breath left in him. Must have been COVID. So she said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her house and carried him up to the upper chamber where he was living and laid him on his own bed and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I'm staying, causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God. And at the word of the Lord, in your mouth is truth. Now, as we see in verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him. As we always point out when we see that phrase, it does not mean that he gets some kind of a mystical or cryptic message. Jesus is the Devar, the Davar. The word, translated to Greek, logos. He's the Devar. The book of 
Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called Devarim. Devarim. Much can be said about the term, the word Devar, and we deal with it on other teachings. Nonetheless, let's look at this now. When somebody has a real message from the Lord, they don't have a message. They have an encounter with Christ by the Holy Spirit. When people are seeking in a crisis for a message, oh Lord, give me a word, give me a vision, give me a picture, Lord, give me the give me. That is clairvoyance. They're seeking the message. They're not seeking the Lord. Once the Lord shows up, the message is obvious. They'll tell you what it is. In a crisis, even under normal conditions, but particularly in crisis conditions, the answer is not in a message. The answer is in Jesus. Then you will get the message. Then you'll get the message. If somebody is seriously ill and they require a specialist physician, a consultant as they're called in England, you don't say, oh, oh, Lord, give me a cure. You don't go looking for a cure on the internet. You go looking for a cardiovascular surgeon or a rheumatologist or a neurologist. You look for the person. Once the person shows up, you know what to do. I'm a technophobe. I'm a complete and utter cyber idiot. If you Google cyber idiot, It'll come up with a picture of me. Don't ask me why, but I was somebody who was a good, I was good with science, but terrible with technology. It's okay in a book <laughs> or a blackboard or a computer screen, but don't ask me to do anything. If you explain combustion theory, the Christian creationist, Professor Andy McIntosh, is a, one of the world's experts in, in combustion theory, physics, and in, in the mathematical equations that explain it. Uh, we did a conference with him once. If you explain, if Andy McIntosh explains combustion theory, I can understand it. Maybe I can even understand it better than the majority of people. But please don't ask me to change a carburetor. <laughs> I can tell you how the engine fires, but don't ask me where the pistons are. I'm just a technophobe. I don't know anything. And when I get into computer trouble, I call Charles Jardine or I call Art in Seattle or something. If I'm in the States, I'll call Steve in Israel. I'll call somebody. Who knows what they're doing? Because I do not. I'm not looking to solve this problem myself. I don't know how to do it. I'm looking for somebody who can. In a crisis, don't seek a word. Seek the word. Once you have the word, Everything else will fall into place automatically. Among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals, so often they get into mysticism and Gnosticism, and they're too biblically ignorant to know that's what they're doing. They get into clairvoyance, imagining it's prophecy. Don't seek a word. Seek the word then you'll have an understanding of what to do. They'll show you, they'll tell you. 
and Elijah was in dire straits. Dire straits. He goes to Zarephath. Zarephath is etymologically related to the Hebrew infinitive to burn <laughs> or to purify with fire. Lisrof. Lisrof. Zarephath, Lisrof, same root or shortish. The Lord is coming for a spotless bride. The hardship that faithful believers and the faithful church will endure, however miserable, will have a purifying effect. I have seen this in one communist country particularly where I visit, or at least I used to visit before COVID regularly. These people have a pure Christianity, they have pure hearts. The Lord will use this pressure. It will, he will use the fire to purify. And he comes to the widow's house at Sidon. Now, let's freeze it right there for a moment. We have to understand what this means for the first coming of Jesus. Remember, all of the prophets typify the Messiah in some way, Elijah not being an exception. This takes place at Sidon in Lebanon, where this Gentile woman in desperation comes to Elijah because of her son. Remember at Sidon in Lebanon, the Gentile woman, the Syrophoenician woman, comes to Jesus at the same location? When things happen at the same location in Scripture, and the text is emphatic, this is where this happens. When you see two or more things happening at the same place, it usually means there's some kind of a spiritual and theological connection between the two events by virtue of the fact that they happen at the same location. When you see two things, even separated by centuries, transpiring at the same location, there's usually a reason, maybe even always a reason, but you can safely say usually. So this Gentile woman is desperate and she comes to Elijah. He foreshadows Christ at Saddam, doesn't he? Then raises the widow's son from the dead. Well, at the village of Nain, what did Jesus do? He comes into town and there's the funeral and the mother is crying and her son is dead. Jesus comes and raises the kid from the dead. Elijah foreshadows Jesus. You understand? Now, what else does he do that foreshadows Jesus in his first coming? Remember the little Jewish boy who bought his picnic lunch that his mother made him with the loaves and fishes to Jesus? He didn't have much. There were thousands of people, according to Mark, and it happens twice that Jesus does this. He just kept making more and more food appear. Jesus took a little bit, and it became endless. It became more than sufficient. And, of course, there was 12 baskets full at the end, corresponding to the apostles and the tribes of Israel and so forth, in figure, in, I'm sorry, in, in symbol. But Jesus was able to make the food just miraculously appear. It just kept coming and coming and coming. Even though there was only a little bit of it, it just kept coming. So Elijah does the same thing. There's only a little bit of flour in the dish, right? <laughs> but, it, but it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Again, Elijah foreshadows Christ, doesn't he? Foreshadows Jesus. Again, we have to understand his ministry for his own time. We have to understand his ministry for the first coming of Jesus. And we have to understand his ministry for our time, 
before we can properly address the issue for his ministry in the future concerning the return of Christ. Don't try to get to D unless you've got a handle on A, B, and C. Don't do the calculus if you can't do the algebra. Don't do the algebra unless you know how to count. Let's look. There will be a process of purification under pressure for the faithful believers in the future, for the faithful church. It will not be easy. It will require a tremendous amount of faith. But no matter how difficult things are for everybody else, we may rest assured there will always be flour in the dish and oil in the jar. Of course, they needed oil, probably Shemin Zayat, olive oil, to make the cakes out of the flour. Now notice, the ravens just bought the bread to Elijah. A time is going to come when people are going to have to know how to make the bread themselves. One of the purposes of what we're doing now is indeed by the grace of God to pass out the grain. I wrote a couple of books called Grain for the Famine and so forth. Okay, that's grain. But a more advanced purpose is for you to know how to make your own bread. You've got enough of the ingredients to begin to understand the word of God for yourself. Not necessarily to be able to teach it to others, but to know how to bake your own bread. Because the time is coming where it is going to be very difficult for people like me or like anybody to pass out the grain. The Lord, however, will make sure you have the flour and he will make sure you have the oil. The time to learn how to bake is now. I'm happy to pass out the grain. Thank God for the ravens. But we have to look at the future. We all have to learn how to bake. They might even kill guys like me. I mean, it says in Daniel that many of them will fall. They'll come gunning for you. If you're a leader and they don't like what you say, they'll come gunning. I might get knocked off if I'm still here. I don't know. Who knows? If I ever get martyred, it's because the Lord considers me to be expendable. But who knows? You have to take baking lessons. Little boy likes his waffles. Little girl likes her hotcakes. But when she's old enough, her mother shows her how to make them for herself. Cooking lessons. God will provide the grain. God will provide the oil. The woman is going to have to know how to make the cakes. Woman being the church, the bride of Christ. Now, let's look at the oil. There's oil and wine in Zion. We know that different liquids, of course, typify the Holy Spirit in different aspects of his person and ministry like the new wine and worship and living water as we looked at, but also the anointing of the spirit, the oil. 
You need the oil to make the cakes. To make the flour congeal, you need the oil. The bread in the Middle East is like pita. It's kind of different than our bread. It's, if you've been to the Middle East, it's, you have a better idea what I'm talking about. You need the oil. In other words, you can have the flour, but without the Holy Spirit, it's not going to do you much good. There are non-believers who have Bibles on their shelves. There are unbelieving churches. There are liberal clergymen. There are even liberal academic theologians who are not saved, who can read the scriptures in Greek and Hebrew. The flower's there, but they can't make any cakes. That takes oil. That takes oil. Yes. An evangelist can preach a salvation message. And it may be true and theologically, doctrinally correct. And because it's the word of God, some people might get saved. But a real evangelist is filled with the spirit, man. He gets up there. A lot of people get, where, where is this guy coming from? Look at this. Well, Takes the oil. Takes the oil. There are academics who can expound the scripture verse by verse in a boring, dead, scholarly exercise. If the Holy Spirit's not in it, it doesn't matter how good it is academically or linguistically, and believe me, I respect academic theology if it's properly used. Jesus said, I will send you scouts, scribes, and so forth. I don't, I've got no objection to academic theology as long as it is administrated under the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. But if it isn't, you've got flour with no oil. You're not making a cake. You're just making dust, <laughs> white dust. No, white dust is something you inhale that makes you sneeze. You need to make the cake. That takes the Holy Spirit. This woman is desperate. Desperate, she's up against the wall. We're gonna eat our last meal before we starve to death. That's what she says. I'm gonna get some sticks, I'm gonna make a cake for myself and a cake for my son. We're going to eat it as our last meal, and then we're going to die. It may feel like that. But when the ministry of Elijah shows up, that's not what happens. When the ministry of Elijah shows up, there will always be flour in the dish and oil in the jar. I guarantee you, based on the authority and assurance of the word of God, I guarantee you that things are going to go from bad to worse and worse to worse still. There will be drought and there will be famine. But I can also guarantee you that you're not going to go hungry. There will absolutely Be flour in the dish and oil in the jar for the faithful people of God in the last days. And so we see the ministry of Elijah. We see it's for his own day, of course. We see it's about the first coming of Christ. We see it's for the coming days before Christ returns. But we also see it is for right now, for you and for me. This is our assurance. 
Thank you so much for listening. Amos? Yeah, God bless you. Thank you very much for that, as usual. A lot of stuff to cover. And many questions I know will come from the panel and people elsewhere tonight. But thank you all for staying the distance with us tonight. We have had a bit of a difficult night. Uh, some people didn't, unfortunately, get on to the, the Zoom uh, question and answer session, which we're online, but many people are watching on the RTN and via the Moriel live stream. So thank you for staying with us. One thing I just want to mention to you, just before we go back to Jacob, for some of your questions. We've been sending out emails. Some of you have been receiving them. Some of you have not. Uh, we don't know why that, that is. Charles has looked into this, and a lot of people, depending on their browser, depending on the software, it's automatically being directed into your spam folder, not into your main folder. So please check your spam folder to see if you are receiving the emails with the link for the program. But we have had to go back to emailing out a link every week because of last week's disruption. So that will be the norm. We will email you out the link, normally a few days beforehand, with the access details onto the Zoom um, meeting here tonight. But also, you will need to go to rtntv.org. That's rtntv.org and subscribe to then get onto that mailing list. We will not be sending out any details to anybody unless you subscribe to RTN TV, thereby we can actually manage the emails and send you the correct information. Now, some of you again had some issues. You were on it and you're not finding it now. If you're having problems, please email me. at amos at rtntv.org. That's amos at rtntv.org. I will have a look at it, send you testimonies, and if necessary, send it on to Charles to have a look at it. But we know there's been a few problems, but we are in our, in our infancy and we're trying our best to make this work for you. But the Lord's on our side and the numbers are growing. And the fact is you're staying here tonight and even listening to me now is a real blessing. So thank you very much. But rtntv.org, you will need to subscribe if you want to take part in the Zoom message from this week on. There's no other way for it. We have to manage the security of everyone involved and obviously your data is something which we have responsibility for. So thank you for that. And also the RTN online TV Bible study on Facebook, where you can join others like yourselves, ask questions and develop your fellowship there. Jacob, one of the things that I would just like to expand on, and it's something that you mentioned very much in the message tonight, and again, there's overlaps in other messages. When you look at Matthew 6, 26, and the birds of the fields, the flowers, all the rest of it, we look at the man of the children of Israel, we look at the quails, and you also mentioned tonight the, the, the widow, and the flour and the oil. The Lord always provides. We might not get what we want, but we'll get what we need. How important then is that whenever we look at the interpretations of, of, of Scripture, we don't look at it at, at surface value. We're not looking at um, the census plenier understanding of, we're looking at it pesher and pesher. We're actually looking at it in a spiritual and a physical reality. How important is to our understanding of Scripture actually to go beneath, beneath the surface? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I respond to Amos's question and comments in two portions. Once again, our profound apologies for the need to have changed the format and to restrict entry, uh, not really restrict it, but limit, limit the way it was. We were attacked last week and we have no choice. There are people out there who the devil will use to disrupt this thing if they can. They tried it last week and they would try it again. And we just have absolutely no choice. Our apologetic regrets, but there's no other technical solution. Now, I'll be happy to take questions, providing that they are directly related to tonight's subject. In response to what Amos said, by the grace of the Lord, to him be the glory. I hope tonight that I helped you understand what's happening in light of scripture. And I told you what's going to happen. I told you what's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, you shouldn't be listening to me. I'm a false teacher. I told you what's happening, and I told you what's going to happen. The time frame, I don't know. Could be quick, could be sudden, could be progressive. I don't know, but I told you what's going to happen. How did I know? Same way you can know. When all else fails, read the directions. James said Elijah was a man like us. It was written for our instruction. 
in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus told us what was going to happen. Now, as these things unfold and as they begin to happen, and even before they happen, the Holy Spirit shows us through the scripture how it's going to happen. I do not deny prophecies that are predictive. I do not deny the Lord can speak through dreams. I do not deny it. I'm not a cessationist. I'm a continuationist. By definition, I believe God can and does speak that way. But it will always be based on exegesis. It will always be based on what's already revealed in his word. Don't look for a dream or a vision or a prophecy. Don't look for that stuff until you've got your handle on the scripture. Anything he's going to tell you or tell me or tell us by any other means is always going to be based solidly on what is already in the scripture. God does not trust prophecies of a predictive nature. He does not trust visions to people who are not scripturally grounded. Don't listen to people like Doreen Virtue or Chris Rosebro. God does not trust those kinds of revelations to people like that. Unless we understand what these scriptures mean. Now, look, I said something tonight that should have been basic. And for our regular people, it is basic. But for most Christians, it's not basic. He prophesies for his own time. He prophesies for the first coming. He's prophesied for our time. And he prophesies for the return of Christ. All in the same text. Most churches don't teach that. Most churches don't know that. Many of their pastors wouldn't know that even, unfortunately. Now, you can go back at better times in church history and read commentators and preachers like Harry Ironside. There were people who had incredible insight for the times in which they lived. There were times when Christians would know how to interpret the scripture along these lines. And again, I'm not suggesting I'm the only one by any means. All the Old Testament prophets prefigured Jesus. Just look at what they did, and, and it's a shadow of Christ. At one time, or at better times, that would have been obvious to Christians. You understand? People would have known that. They would have been taught that. But not now. It's because there's a famine. They should be eating gourmet cuisine. And at best, they're getting junk food in too many churches. It comes a time before Jesus comes, we have to begin to understand the scriptures better. Their depth is getting more and more shallow. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Again, I would refer you back to the teaching, Kashrut and Famine, and to our books, Grain for the Famine. These things are essential. If we don't know these things, we will not know how to properly weigh and test prophecies to see if they're from the Lord will be like those sad people who believed Pat Robertson and Beth Moore that Donald Trump was going to be elected. They just prophesy what they want to hear. Now, don't get me wrong. I voted for Donald Trump and prayed for him every day. And the man we have now is evil. But those prophets are just as evil. They're misleading the people of God to trust in a lie says in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah 28. They're just as evil. You can't say that! I didn't. Read Jeremiah 28. God said it. It is vital. It is essential for our spiritual survival 
and it is vital and essential to be ready for the return of Jesus and to fulfill the calling he has given us to help prepare the way for his return. Remember, any one of us could have been born at a different time in history. God elected we would be born now. But more than that, he elected we would be born again now. God put us here. He put you here. Me here. Of all people. I was a cocaine addict when I was in college. Of all people. He has put us here at this time. To prepare the way for his son's return. It is a calling of which none of us is not only not worthy. But in our own strength and wisdom not even up to. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. And that's why he gave us his word. I trust that answers the question. It does, Jacob. Thank you very much. I suppose really it just boils down to that simple old scripture. It's baby food and it's solid food. We, we have to recognize that our walk with the Lord is progressive. It's dynamic. It has to grow. Our depth, our understanding, our ability to discern and then to pass on that information must also grow through the Holy Spirit. But so many times people behind the pulpit and people sitting on the pews, it's just like watching television. It's just information and just washes over them and it doesn't have any impact. It's really tragic. Let's go to our panel tonight. If anyone's any questions, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, it'd be good to hear from you. Keep the subjects, questions, relation to the teaching tonight on Elijah. Who's first with a question tonight? Dave is on the button straight away. Dave, good evening to you. Hello, uh, you're talking to me? Yes, Dave, all the way from the Okay, uh, beach. okay, good, good. Yes, first, uh, thank you, Jacob, for pointing out that Malachi scripture, my kids. Uh, I have four daughters, grandkids as well. They just totally reject. But to give you a little background, and I think you'll you'll appreciate this a little bit, is I got saved in a Jesus People coffee house in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by the preaching of James or uh, Jim Polisari. I don't know if you know that name at all, but um, I uh, came to know the Lord, and I and I want to say the scripture that, of course, I didn't even know the scripture at the time. You shall seek me, and you shall find. Me, if you search for me with all your heart. And uh, I think that scripture just fits so much that um, over these years, it's been many years, I was born in 1947. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a, at an age now where uh, God is enlightening me through people like yourself. I, I, I ran into you through John Haller. But, um, and, you know, yeah. my it, mentor, sorry, my question. Dave. Yeah, we just need to know your question, though. Okay. What's the question? Well, uh, my question uh, has to do, I have two questions, but the, the, the question I have is, um, uh, a generation. Uh, is I think eighty years, isn't it? Eighty years? No, th no. There are th there are different definitions of scripture for generation. But what's well, I can answer that. But what's your question? Well, it it was. Do we look for the Lord sooner? Uh, based on anything to do with that generation number? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, are you looking really, at the generation shall not pass away? Is that what you're saying, basically? Yeah. yeah, that that's not really in tonight's subject too much, but I will answer the question. The Greek word the, the, is genus from the Hebrew mean. It means of a kind, of a kind. We are the generation of Jesus. We are of his kind. In other contexts, a generation can be about 40 years. If you're looking at it in terms of biology, biological lifespan, longevity, things like that.
But the only thing generation needs to be mean is of a kind. We are of his kind. We're Christians. We are the generation of Jesus. Okay? Like you'd say, the next generation of jet fighters or the next generation of supercomputers. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. not specific about a time. It's specific about a kind. Okay? So okay. it depends on the context of the scriptural passage you're talking about. What was your other question? Oh, uh, this one doesn't really relate. It was okay. so. It, okay. It, I'll okay. save it for next <laughs> another okay. time. Thank you, Dave. The Valors in South London, North Kent, Rosemary and Steve. One of you want to have a question? I can see your hands waving. God bless you, Mike. Thank you very much, um, Jacob. Uh, it, I, I, I'm seeing something of a parallel here um, with the breaking of the third seal and the black horse. Um, with regards to famine, um, the intriguing part that I've always, or the, one, the part that I've always found intriguing, and perhaps you can uh, speak to it if it's got uh, relevance to what you said tonight, it is does. where uh, he's, uh, the horseman is told to spare the oil and the wine. Correct, directly. You're exactly correct. I'm glad to see you're baking your own bread. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly, it does. We were going to mention that was not, I, that was something I, well, was, we, I didn't get into Elijah in the book of Revelation yet, so, but you, you are correct. Okay. Thank you. Oh, short and sweet, Steve. Well done. Todd Darling, you're next. Good evening, Todd. <clears throat> uh, hi, Jacob. Uh, Todd hi. Darling here from Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, or Appleton, Wisconsin, where you used to speak at uh, the Calvary Chapel there. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes. Part of our ministry operates out of there. The mail, the mail orders go out of Appleton still. Right. I, uh, my warehouse actually stores all your books. Oh, yeah. gee, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Appleton's through, through. the home of Harry Houdini. Right, it is. And, yeah, Corey Wynn and I have been in the same Bible study together for the last uh, 14 years right. or so. You even came to, one of, you came to my home and, and taught at one of the Bible studies with Corey and myself. Okay. Years, years ago, it's probably 10 years now. Um, <clears throat> I digress. I have a question uh, regarding the ministry of Elijah as it relates to his second coming. Um, so more about the timing of the two witnesses. You know, the Calvary chapels that I attend, they're all pre-trib, as you well know. Yes. Um, and the reason you're not invited back, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but nonetheless, it appears that you were referencing Malachi 4, 5, which has Elijah coming before the great day of the Lord. Yes. And then last week we talked, I believe you talked a little bit about Revelation 14, where he is going, the, they're being told to come up here between <clears throat> the sixth and seventh trumpet. That's Revelation 11, yes. 11, 14, yes. Oh, yeah, 11, 14, okay, yes. Okay, 11, 14. <clears throat> so it appears that, yeah, you know, in the Calvary chapels, they always teach that the three and a half years is the first three and a half years that the two witnesses will arrive at the beginning of the seven year Daniel 70th week. But it appears from what we're seeing here is that they're actually coming um, sometime before the great day of the Lord. Yes. Uh, or the seventh seal, probably be probably around the fifth or sixth seal. Yes. And then they're they're being taken up between the sixth and seventh trumpet the second and third wall yes. um, there's a great earthquake i've heard you teach on that that you know resurrections occur uh, in conjunction with earthquakes so it, it seems like that goes in hand would you would you agree with that that uh, they're taken up between the sixth and seventh trumpet and that they would come before the great day of the lord it does take place in the interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet okay absolutely yes now, the great day of the Lord commences with something called the three woes, okay? The three woes. You are absolutely right that it occurs during that interlude. But the rapture of the church occurs between the sixth and seventh seal interlude. When you see the interludes in the trumpets, in the seals, or in the vials, when you see an interlude, something major happens at that point. The trumpets have to follow the seals because the trumpets emanate from 
the seventh seal. Therefore, they must be sequential. Okay? Right. So that's interesting. So you're saying that the great and terrible day of the Lord is separate than the day of the Lord, which would be... No, 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 no. Okay. The day of the Lord is what we call in Hebrew, Haronia, the wrath of God, the wrath of Yahweh. It is when he pours out his wrath, not tribulation, his wrath right. on the kingdom of Antichrist following the rescue of the faithful believers and the resurrection, following the parousia. The parousia lights the fuse for the great day of the Lord. Okay? Now we're told Elijah has to come before that. <coughs> So if one of those witnesses <coughs> is indeed Elijah, as most people believe, it would have to come before that point in the first three and a half years. But the three and a half years does not have any correspondence <coughs> to the timing of the seals or the trumpets. The halfway point, the halfway point of <coughs> the rapture of the uh, seven years, the rapture happens <coughs> at some point after that halfway point. Okay. So we have a book called our page, though. It's Obviously, more than I can go into now, but I, I know that you addressed that briefly in there. But um, I've had a hard time making it through the entire book. I've gotten yeah. most of the way through. But so, but you would concur that the two witnesses are not going to be present at the very beginning of the Daniel seventieth week before the first seal. They're going to show. Oh, they may up, be present, but they the, may be present in the wilderness. Yeah, but the but the focus of their ministry in chapter 11 is all is tied to three and a half years okay and, and we know the ending is between the seventh the sixth and seventh trumpet therefore if yeah, they're just, ending they're the when, they're when they're raptured up so if you subtract three they're, and not half, they're not raptured they're resurrected okay you, you understand what I'm saying they're not raptured. I, I well, okay, I, I guess I'm seeing them laying dead on the ground for three right, and a half right. days. That, that's a resurrection. Then they're, then they're brought up into the air. Right, okay, that's resurrection, okay. Yeah, um, they were dead. Yeah, they were dead, correct. They replay what happened to Jesus. They, you know, the, the, right. okay, they replay what happened to Jesus. We read in Revelation 11, whoops. They finished their testimony, I guess, verse 7. And when the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, this is the Antichrist. They're in direct conflict with the Antichrist now and overcomes them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt. We deal with this again in the book, our page. So those who the people and tribes and tongues will look on their dead bodies. Uh, to be laid in a tomb, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate as they will send gifts to one another. Maybe some have speculated it could be Christmas because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half years, breath comes into them, and they stood on their feet, and a great fear came upon those. Came upon those. Okay, now we see this. I will grant authority to my witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are prophesying already before the great day of the Lord, but they come in conflict, conflict with the Antichrist. Don't forget, the Antichrist is already active from the beginning of the seven years at least. 
but he does not set up the image in the temple and show his true hand until the halfway point. You know what I'm saying? I do. And they're in conflict with him before that. Okay. Right. So that that appears to be somewhere around when they start the <clears throat> when they hold back the rain for that three and a half year period which kind of goes in line with what you were talking, they're, they're holding back, you know, in uh, the picture, they're not being any Holy Spirit for three and a half years, you know, sometime around that fifth or sixth seal is when they start that three and a half year period. Now you're saying that maybe they're wandering around like Elijah wandered. Yeah, like, you know, J John the Baptist was around. Right. You know, but and he was doing stuff, but his ministry climaxed six months before Jesus' ministry began. But he had been there for some time before that. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So they could be here for a, a now, longer another time. Fact, yeah. Another fact that is Elisha. Remember Elisha with the bears killed the 42? Yes. Th there's a connection there. Because um, Elisha had the same spirit. But now, now I digress. Okay. Another question, please. So... Todd, just, just one, clarify one thing, Jacob. Todd, you mentioned there, and it may have been a misspeak, you said the Holy Spirit was removed. The Holy Spirit isn't actually removed. He just stops restraining. Correct. It may well have been. I, I, I the agree. The Holy Spirit what? doesn't go. Yeah. yeah. I was drawing a parallel between Elijah holding back the rain for yeah, three yeah. and a half years. Correct. Anthea, you have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jake. Thank you for your teaching. Much appreciated. Um. Yeah, you spoke quite a bit about the famine for the word of, of God. Um, and I myself, um, I'm really sort of quite surprised. I was saved out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, it took me an, an awful long while to figure out, find my way to another church. And what's amazed me an awful lot is they don't, the lack of knowledge of the Bible and the lack of um, sort of any discernment or, or anything mentioned about the times we're living in now. Um, I did start going to an Anglican church and I actually got baptised as a Christian it was about four years ago. By immersion um, or by sprinkling? Pardon? Did you get baptised by immersion or by sprinkling? Immersion. Okay. Uh, in the sea, in Torquay. Okay. Um, and I know, but I know quite a lot of uh, Christian ladies that I would say are Christian ladies, but they seem to have more loyalty to their denomination than they actually do to what's being taught there, whether it's from the yes. Word of God or not. Yes. And you spoke, you spoke about this. Um, purifying process of, for the church. Do you think that that is what's happening now? Or we're being tested and sick? Okay, right? I'll answer your question. First of all, we're not in Zarephath yet. Zarephath has not happened yet. That phase of Elijah's ministry has not happened yet. Okay, it's coming, but it's not yet. What I said tonight about the situation you described with these women who you know, are, their loyalty is more to the institutional church than it is to the word of God. That is, again, what Elijah confronted in, in the person of John the Baptist. Remember, they, they were trusting in their identity, their religious identity, and the people were not being fed the word of God in the temple. They were going out to hear John. Well, the, 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 the clergy by most of the clergy, were trying to get the people to be religious, to trust in their institutional identity with the Levitical priesthood and things like that. That is what corresponds to your question, okay? If you want to get fed, you're not going to get fed in the C of E anymore. Uh, I just watched, I just read Justin Philby's remarks yesterday, today. I read his remarks to the prime minister today about COVID. The man is pathetic. The man is pathetic. Um, it, it, it's a joke. Uh, you know, you have the Archdruid of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the former one, was actually a Druid. Yeah, was the Druid. I mean, it's, it's absurd. It's completely absurd. 
the best thing the Church of England can do for England is probably drop dead, because it's already dead. It's dead theologically, it's dead morally, and it's dead spiritually. Um, and those who stay in it have to compromise with it. Yes. You know, so that is the aspect. The other thing I would tell you is we did a, now there's a breakaway Church of England of, of, of people who, believers who left and they're continuing to call it the Church of England continuing. I'm not faulting those people. But the, the idea of the Church of England in the terms of William Tyndale or the Oxford Martyrs or Ridley Latimer Hooper or Thomas Cranmer or, or J.C. Ryle, that's gone. It's gone and it's not coming back. Uh, now, and the evangelical leaders are well, it's Nicky Gumbel and these people, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's just absurd. Concerning your Jehovah's Witness background, we have a teaching, I think it's on the internet, but I'm sure you can get it. It's for people who've come out of cults and it's called Phases to Freedom. Phases to Freedom. I would suggest coming from a JW background that you listen to it if you can, Phases to Freedom. It might even be a video, I'm not sure but it's phases to freedom, okay? Thank you, Jacob. I've had an awful long and hard journey trying to um, come out from indoctrination process. How long have you been out of that cult? Um, I've actually been out of it for about 13 years. Yeah. Um, but my eldest son is still in it and he's cut me out of his life. Yeah, I know, I know. Please listen, to, may the Lord convict him and show him the truth. Thank you. Please listen to Phases to Freedom if you have a chance to, okay? Okay. One more Thank question. Thank you, Uncle. Perhaps. We have time for one more Mika, question. Mika, Mika Slew. Mika Slew in Norway. Good evening to you. In Norway. Must be called no, up there. from Finland. Oh, Finland. Finland. My apologies, Mika. I thought it was Norway. Yeah. Next no, it's, it's a long way to Norway from here. So, uh, uh, my question was, it was mostly answered through those couple of answers that you were making, Jacob, already. But uh, I must point out a couple of things uh, what considers this uh, issue, what we were have to, having today here. And last time when was this attack against this uh, Zoom meeting, that all this that you were telling tonight, that, that you know, we're getting to the point that that we are going to be tested and people are going to attack against us. This is already happening here uh, in Finland also, that it's uh, it's global, of course. Yeah. But but as a, as an opera singer, I've seen this uh, progress last, let's say, 10 years. And it's amazing that it's, it's complete change from old values, even in singing itself, to this... this um, ungodly, unnatural uh, celebration of uh, immorality and, and, and sin. And yes, of course. But let me ask you a question. And don't take this the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at uh, Verdi's La Traviati. Yeah. The words of the of Brindisi, of the, of the drinking song. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard of anything more hedonistic? <laughs> Well, I, I have the pleasure. I have. Don't resist the. Te Let's not resist temptation. Have you ever? <laughs> what you say is true, but, but <laughs> it's not that simple. Uh, well, it's that is true. That is true. I, 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 I have to admit this, and and more I understand the scriptures, less I can sing those things. <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing. You know, well, you, well, you know better than I do that. The Pope unfortunately condemned opera because he saw it was decadent. And that is why Handel began, came to England and began composing oratios like the Messiah and, and Yehuda the Maccabee is because the Pope banned opera. So the original oratios, of course, as you know, were simply opera without the costumes and that. <laughs> so good, good can still come from it. Yeah, the, it's true. and uh, But the, there's also a difference in uh, like... Uh... The decadence in those pieces it's a, it's a really amazing that you you take like um um certain certain composers 
uh, mostly like Puccini, and and yeah. he was a. Uh, it's totally decadent. This whole production, uh, more yeah, or less. I know. Yes. And then and then you go to the uh, the Wagnerian side, and there's so much occultism and mythicism. A lot of Va Wagner's music is demonically inspired. People talk about punk rock and things like this. Wagner's the same. Yeah, no, no. he was an anti-Semite. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. That's it. Well, I'd like, like to hear you. Sing, I'd like to hear you, hear you with the marriage of Figaro sometime or something. <laughs> Well, that's not that's not that is not my you know voice type. It's uh, I I'm not a, I'm not a baritone. I'm a, I'm a tenor. So okay, so that's a, that's a different thing. But that's really much thank to thank to you, thank you, Jacob and okay. uh, and you like to... you like Carreras and those guys, right? And Placido Domingo. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I have been looking those, but if I'm looking this kind of people that I'm listening, of course, Pavarotti, but but uh, Franco Corelli, Fritz Wunderli, he is amazing singer yes. in that sense. Uh, there's a many others, but uh, Domingo, yeah, I, I personally don't like him so much. No? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> He's an amazing actor and musician, but uh, as a voice wise, if I'm looking at it as a professional, like, no, okay. I don't feel like. Very good. Right, thank you, Mika. Bless you. Bless you. Keep safe. One more. One more. One, One of the things that we looked at when you spoke, Jacob, on Kings, you mentioned that Elijah went to the widow and asked her to bake him a cake first. Is there a significance, is there a typology, a symbology there that we need to analyze or, or expand on? Or was it just purely that's the way it was? No, well, that's the way it was, obviously. But those who will understand the need to stand with and support faithful ministries in difficult times. That will be the meaning. In fact, yeah. the thought across my head, should I mention it or not? That's what it would mean. You know, understanding the greater purposes of God and being willing to stand with and support faithful ministries in difficult times. But I'm reluctant to say things like yeah. that because it sounds like I'm fundraising. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Jake, we've had a couple of questions tonight about the book, which I know you're nearly finished. People just want to know when they can expect it, etc. Please pray. <laughs> Every time I try to edit it, I get another phone call or another crisis to deal with. Uh, Wayne, you had a question. No, I think that's it. I think that's everybody tonight. Oh, he got his hand up. Wayne Clark, good evening. Clark, good evening. It was it was about your new book. <laughs> okay, well, I promise I will try to get it done. We need it for the okay. famine. Yes, that's what, no bomb in Gilead. What really <laughs> happens after the rapture? Okay, that's it. That's it for tonight, Jacob. Thank you very much. If anybody would like to have a look, we don't normally promote or try and sell anything here, but if anyone would like to have a look at some of the, the previous editions, which, which Todd looks after in the States and in Canada, go to the Morial website, have a look there and simply put in your order and it will be provided. They're not overly expensive, but they are a really good resource, particularly at this time, whether it's Harpezo or Obama and Gilead, very relevant to the times we're living in, but have a look there. And if it means buying one for your church, then please do so, or your fellowship. Yeah, I think you'll be blessed by it. We're back again next Wednesday, same time, seven o'clock. Please remember, if you don't subscribe to rtntv.org, we yes. can't send you out the email invitation. It's as simple as that. It's just, it's going to cause too much grief, too much confusion, which we've already seen. So please, if you haven't done so already, and that includes the guys out there on the, on the live stream from Oriel TV and RTN TV, if you want to ask any questions, please subscribe and we can send you out the link to join into the Zoom um, congregation or Zoom studio, whatever you wish to call it. Until next week, God bless you. Take good care of yourselves. If you need to find out any more information about that, please email me. My name's Amos. It's amos at rtntv.org. I will get back to you. It mightn't be immediate, but I will get back to you. Jacob, just close in prayer before we go, brother. Okay. Heavenly Father, we do pray your blessing upon all of us and our families. Keep us faithful to you in these last days. Protect us, Lord. Meet our needs. But above all, Lord, empower us with your spirit to leave to live godly lives 
and to fulfill the calling you've given us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you all next week, folks. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye. 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 For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.